We are going to talk all kinds of stuff about pointers today. You, you've got Willow Creek Kennels, and you're pretty well known as a GSP guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk to you. We get we get a lot of requests about puppies and and finding and you know reading bloodlines, pedigrees, finding good pointers. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a kind of a flusher guy. And so we've had a whole bunch of people on talking about labs and, you know, how do you find the best bloodlines for labs and what should be looking for and hunt tests and field trials and all this stuff. But we haven't had anybody talk about that on when it comes to pointers. So can you just start us off and say, you know, let's, let's say we've got the average person who, you know, they want to hunt, maybe pheasants, grouse, um, you know, maybe, maybe make a trip down South or something for quail and they want a good family dog and they're looking for a dog that can do it all and have the right health checks and everything. How do they start? There's a lot of information online, a lot more than there used to be. Um, I, I would start by Googling what you're looking for. Uh, if you think it's a short hair, a German, we, we breed German short hairs here. Mm-hmm. If you think it's a different breed, you can look into the different breeds. Um, Brittany's wire hairs, uh, pointers, setters, you can look into those dogs, uh, read about them. There's a lot of information online. So once you kind of decide on a breed or two, then you can start looking into those breeds and uh, start looking at breeders. Uh, usually I, I do a lot of searching myself. We're constantly looking for uh, genetic diversity, bring a new male in keep genetic diversity and um, we're pretty particular and we're looking for certain things in a dog. So we, we look pretty hard, but uh, if a person's looking for a good hunting dog, good family dog, a dog to go hunting with um, kind of uh, that's what most people are looking for. Uh, You start reading different breeders. If you Google German short hairs, there's going to be several breeders that come up uh and those breeders are more reputable maybe um more well known is probably why they're successful um and then if you read about what they're doing uh there was one kennel i really liked their dogs they're winning national championships i wanted to breed to one of their males uh they had a male that was a versatile champion uh they did a lot of field trialing and when i talked to them they they were really interested in run like run was really important so they bred dogs that run really big um and they were really looking to develop that but that's that's not quite the direction we're headed in, in central Minnesota. We do a lot of grouse hunting. Ninety nine percent of our customers want a dog that's that's close working, easy to handle, kind of an easy going dog. So mm-hmm. we have to be careful with what we breed to. There's some really nice dogs out there, but we just have to be careful that they match up with what we're looking for and what our customers are looking for. So uh, most most breeders will be pretty upfront and pretty straightforward. I would say the first thing to do is to read their website top to bottom. You know, trainers are busy. Breeders are busy. Um, some of them will talk to you for a long time, and some of them have very limited time, and they might be really hard to get a hold of. Um, and uh, not all dog breeders are business people that are making sure they get back to everybody in 24 hours and, and all of that. So you kind of you got to take that with a grain of salt, but – uh, yeah, to get, to get online, figure out what you're looking for, what kind of, what, what breed of dog, and then start looking into the, 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 the breeders, read about what they're talking, what they're, what they're breeding, what they're looking for, what they're producing. Um, we like dogs that are master hunters, field champions, uh, versatile champions in NAVDA, uh, higher level dogs. Um, mm-hmm. junior titles are great. You know, you get into hunt test, junior, senior, master. Um, they have all have their place. I guess in our breeding program, we're looking for higher, higher level stuff. Um, most of the dogs here, you know, we've done a lot of master hunters. So we're typically going to going to breed to maybe a master hunter, maybe a field champion, maybe a dual champion, which is uh, show and field champion. Um, NAVDA's got some really good dogs, really versatile dogs. NAVDA stands for North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. Um, Clyde Better, uh, sharpshooter kennels. He's, he's one of the best. We bred to his cash dog, uh, a couple times, uh, uh, probably 15 years ago. I bred to his tango dog a couple times. Um, that really, uh, helped us with a lot of water drive and, and dogs that just are very serious in the water. Um, mm-hmm. our, our honker dog is, is the best, best water dog I've ever had. He's, he's been, been good from, from when we first started him. He's, he hit the water great. He would retrieve as many times as you let him. But it just kind of comes down to, uh, you know, a person could get a piece of paper out and write down their, what they want, what's their ideal dog. 
and then and then start looking for it. Yeah. Well, that's let's back up a second because when you bring up the the GSPs you were dealing with that are runners, that that's something that comes up a lot, right? You know, you, there's a there's a huge difference between being a sharp tail hunter out in Montana versus being a you know woodcock and grouse hunter in the Northeast or up in northern Wisconsin or you know tight confines places. How how does the average person, aside from just asking the breeder or or maybe asking to see the dogs work, how do they find out that a dog is you know the the, the GSPs they're looking at are a little bit closer working versus a dog that might be ranging way out and better off in Arizona for quail? So pedigrees are pedigrees are nice. You can look through a pedigree and see see what's in there. If it says national field champion all up and down the pedigree, those dogs are running pretty big. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are like a, like an all age champion. So in field trials, there's there's different tiers. There's uh, all age shooting shooting dog, and then gun dogs. Um, and gun dogs are the closer end. That's typically what a person would be more interested in. But that that's all changing. Uh, years ago, an all age dog is not what an all age dog is today. An all age dog today is is you should see it every five minutes or so. You know, they're, 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 they go and the trainers are typically, the trialers are typically on horseback and they ride fast to keep up with the dogs, but they're developed to run that way as well. So, mm-hmm. um, a lot of it is in development, you know, how you develop a dog. If, uh, if you take them in the woods and tight cover, they're going to be closer working dogs. If a lot comes from you and you move together and you spend a lot of time with your dog, then, then you're a pack with your dog and you're mm-hmm. going to move together. Um, but you, to get back to pedigrees, um, na- you know, there, there's, there can be closer working dogs. Uh, um, the pull towards average is always there in a the breed. So you could take a national all age field, cha- national field champion, all age champion and breed him to a really close working dog and probably get some medium dogs, but you're also going to get some big, big going dogs in that too. Um, so, so again, kind of looking for what you're looking for you know uh, that stuff it can be good and you can talk to breeders and, and see what they think um we bred to some trial dogs uh along the way we're just kind of careful with the you know the independence uh there gets to be a lot of independence as you get into the real serious uh you know national type of competitions so not always is a national champion the best dog for you you know mm-hmm. that's kind of important i'm sure in labs and everything else uh, the great dogs but you have to be careful with the average person that might not have experience with an animal like that uh nab does a really good organization uh, you don't see if you go to a nab to trial or, or nab to nab to test you don't see very many dogs running very big mm-hmm. they're they're pretty close working and it's pretty standard in the nab to world uh the breedings we've done the the, the nab to dogs we've seen um they tend to be closer working it's kind of similar in the hunt tests. Uh, those will be closer working dogs. Master hunters don't have to run big. It's nice if they'll be a hundred yard dog or so, you know, but, uh, and, and cast past that at times, uh, make some nice moves, but they don't have to, they don't have to run that big. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get through their master and score really well, uh, running inside of a hundred yards. All right. So somebody goes out and they go, all right, I got my you know wire hair i got my gsp puppy whatever this is this is a dog that's going to work close for me or this is a dog that's going to range out because i hunt here um what when they get them home what's next because it what, where i want to go with this is i know a lot of people who get pointer pups and they just want to work on pointing because that's the cool part you know they, they want to skip right to the flashy stuff and 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 the point and and, and encouraging the pointing behavior and i, I always wonder are they missing somewhat yeah, like overlooking the the obedience window and the establishing trust window that you should be you should be really working on with a puppy and kind of kind of putting off some of the flashy stuff till the the foundations there yeah yeah i think the first thing to do when you get the puppy home is 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 to get comfortable you know get the puppy comfortable they they just left typically they just left their their family the only family they've ever known other than the the breeders the humans that that helped develop them along the way but they leave their mother around that eight weeks old. They leave their litter mates. It, it can be very uncomfortable. Uh, we try to breed dogs here that are bold and mentally sound that so they can handle those situations better if they get out in hunting situations or, you know, hunt tests or trials or something like that as well. But I think the first thing to, is to pay attention to the puppy, get them comfortable, spend a lot of time with them, um, try not to trigger anxiety. Uh, some problems people have, they'll put them in a crate. 
uh, leave them in the garage. Uh, that's scary. That's very scary for a puppy. Um, they, they, if they were in the wild and they got separated from their family or the pack, they, they might be killed. So Mm -hmm. it's very, it can be very, very, very scary for a, for a puppy. So, so staying with the pup, helping, try not to, try not to trigger fear is a big part of it to develop a dog, to be bold and confident. Um, and yeah, as I think, I think, uh, one, one of the things that popped into my head right away there, there was retrieving, um, pointer people, they want to, they want to see the point right away. That's then, and that's great. Uh, winging a string is pretty common. Take that out and play in the yard and get some pointing and, and see your pup point. Um, you know, that's great. Uh, don't forget about retrieving though. Uh, they can they can have a lot of ability to retrieve, but it needs to be developed. If if it's not developed, uh, it's just uh, it's it's not going to be developed uh, more mm-hmm. or less. Uh, it's something that you have to to develop. So to get out there, um, when we are starting retrieving, those are tools. You know, we if it's going to be a dummy or you know, typically the puppies really like a stuffed animal of some kind, and uh, we'll retrieve that. We find something that they really want, something that they almost vice gripped on that they'll hold on really tight. And that's what we want. We let them carry it and move them around and praise them and all that. Um, but retrieving is really important. Uh, and obedience, absolutely. Um, getting the crate started. Uh, crate training, we're going to need that. So dropping treats in there so the pup can go in there and eat them. Uh, you know, just uh, just getting them comfortable with the crate. I think that's one of the best ways to do it is just to open the door. Like a wire crate where you can drop it through the top. And uh, the puppy runs in there and eats it and he runs back out and drop another one. And he's, he's being positively reinforced for going in there and not being locked in there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, crate training, uh, recalling can be started with a clicker really young. Uh, clicker training is, is really nice for puppies. Um, you basically just put a treat in your hand. And when the puppy comes up and eats that treat out of your hand, you would click at the same time. If you don't have a clicker and you don't, if you don't do clicker training, that's okay too. Uh, as, as long as the dog is touching your hand and eating the food out of your hand, that's, that's kind of our target is the dog touches that target and, and gets the food and gets the click. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you don't need the clicker as much when the puppy is close. The clickers are nice for marking behaviors. You can mark it with a click if they do something when they're 10 feet away from you, but they have to be conditioned to that. Uh, yep. Clicker training. Um, you know, here training is important across the board for all breeds, flushers, uh, uh, pointers, retrievers. Um, but woe training is big for, for, for pointers. So we start woe pretty young. We might just hold up a treat, tease the pup with it a little bit and they'll stop and stop still, you know, they'll, they'll chase it around a little bit. Then they'll usually stop still. And it's kind of part of that's the hand movement that goes along with it. But when they stop and stand still, you can either drop the treat right then or click and drop the treat and that they get that it's, it would be like a, like a rat going into a cage in a science experiment and hitting a lever and the food comes out. You know, they want that food. So they want to make it drop. And, and we basically catch that behavior. We catch them standing still, click and drop the food. Uh, that's a great way to start woe training. Um, 